Welcome to Orange Weekly presented by Krause Health alongside Nate Mink. I'm Brent Axe. Coming up, Mike Waters will join us to talk Syracuse basketball. And Syracuse head coach Dino Babers previews this weekend's matchup at Louisville. But Nate, before we take a step forward to that game, one last step back to the Duke game because what an impressive performance by that defense, particularly in the third quarter. They get three turnovers. It results in 21 points off the bye week, new coordinator in charge, could not have gone better against the Blue Devils, but what lessons do we take from that game that can carry over going forward for the defense? I think, Brent, if Syracuse is healthy, they stand a chance to, to play very well defensively. I think the biggest thing that can carry over from last week into this week is just the overall health of their team on the defensive side of the ball is still in really good shape. Getting McKinley Williams back, I don't think can be talked about enough. He is probably their most physical defensive lineman, his presence in there as a, adds a third interior piece to pair with Josh Black and KJ Ruff. So being able to add a third piece there allows those two other guys to be more fresh throughout the game. Then you have, you know, just him taking on double teams allows for more favorable matchups for not only Black and Ruff inside, but Kendall Coleman and Alton Robinson on the, on the edge. Everything starts with, with that, and I think they have to be really, really good this week against the run because Scott Satterfield, is going to be this, this it's going to be this ground and pound the zone read type offense that if they get those backs JV and Hawkins and Hassan Hall out in space they're so quick that unless Syracuse is really really good uh, ID in the, the run uh, if, if one misstep and it could be six points I think this game coming up against Louisville could turn into a shootout now saying that it, I just jinxed it now it'll be six to three but if it turns out to be a game where everyone on the Louisville schedule when you look at it, Nate, high-scoring games. So if it turns into that, is Tommy DeVito ready to sling it out, take charge of this offense, and keep pace with a Louisville offense that can score? We'll, we'll see. I think it's, it's going to depend on if Syracuse can run the ball, quite frankly. I think the run game really opens up the whole offense. I mean, we saw in the past if Syracuse, if their run game doesn't get revved up, it makes it really, really easy to defend this Syracuse offense. So we know Louisville has weapons, not only in the backfield, but out on the perimeter. Tutu Atwell and uh, Des Fitzpatrick are guys that can run and get behind SU secondary. I think it's really got to take a complete team effort for Syracuse to emerge with a victory on this, on, on this Saturday. I think they have to play well defensively, and they have to score points. They may need to get up into the 40s to beat Louisville. You know, we'll, we'll see. It's a, it's a tall task, but it, it's got to be real complimentary football if they're going to be able to come out with a win. They're all must-wins for the Orange these days, so let's predict this one, Nate. Will this one be a game won by the Orange, which will make that Wake Forest game very interesting at the Dome coming up at the end of the month? I'm going to say no, unfortunately. I think Louisville wins a shootout game. I'm going to go with a score of 38-30. to We'll see some fireworks, but the Cardinals make just one more play than the Orange to win. I, I see it playing out in a similar way. I think Louisville, you know, their strength of their offensive line is run blocking. I think Satterfield can throw enough offensive wrinkles in to just confuse that front seven just enough. If Syracuse does win the game, I think it's going to take a really stellar effort from that front four, you know, particularly Williams, Black, Ruff. If they can shed blocks and just penetrate that backfield and slow down that Louisville run game, you know, I think SU's, and you know, conversely, SU's corners, Frederick and whether it's Trill, Trill Williams or Ify Melifonwu, if they can just stick their guys uh, long enough to maybe allow some of those edge rushers to get into the backfield, I think Syracuse can do it, but I have Louisville winning 34-31. So what Nate and I think about Louisville, let's hear what the head coach thinks. It's time for Syracuse Sound Bites. Tremendous speed, tremendous skill. Um, an offensive line that doesn't get itself into trouble. They have the ability to run the football with the quarterback. Therefore, that gives them, I, th I believe they're averaging close to 200 yards a game rushing, which allows them to control the clock. And normally, if you run the ball for those type of numbers, your turnovers are down. If your turnovers are down and you're running the ball like that, you're possessing the clock. If you don't have a lot of penalties, it doesn't leave a lot of room for the other team to make mistakes and still be able to score with you if you're scoring at a high clip, which is the reason why they're a bowl eligible team and uh, Satterfield's doing a fantastic job over there. Mike, an exciting edition of the what has become the annual Bayheim Bowl at the Carrier Dome, and it was Jimmy Bayheim on his dad's court putting on a show. <laughs> there was a while there. That game was in doubt. Even Cornell took the lead briefly in that game, but it's so interesting to see Jimmy Bayheim taking on such a bigger role with the Big Red this year. 
Yeah, he really is. His junior year now, six foot eight forward, comes into the Carrier Dome, scores 25 points, and with about 10 minutes to go in that game, he puts Cornell ahead. Now, they were going to have to rename the court. Jim Beheim Court, or Jimmy, a right? Couple letters to it, right? It might have made sense at one point, but no, a terrific night for him. He nearly flipped the script. You know, we, we usually think of the Beheim ball, you know, j hopefully Jimmy plays well, and, and but Buddy and Jim and Syracuse are going to get out with the win. But it was a little dicey there last night until Syracuse took over late. But uh, a great night for Jimmy, Cornell, um, and of course, then, you know, Jim and Bu Buddy do get the win. Frankly, that was a game at times only a mother could love, and Julie Beheim was the happiest person in the building because Jimmy was the best player on the court, even though their team lost. Moving on to Elijah Hughes, Mike, what a performance from him offensively so far this year. I think we expected that. What I probably didn't quite expect are his assist numbers. He leads the team right now with 20, taking on a much bigger role, even in a guard position at times. Yeah, and this is something we did not see out of Elijah last year, uh, the ability to set up teammates and pass the ball. He, as the third or fourth option on last year's team, when he got the ball, usually it was a spot up three and he was letting it fly. This year he comes in and we were talking about Elijah being the go-to guy, and ordinarily you think that means he's going to score more points, and he is. But to see him dish out eight assists, a career high last Saturday against Seattle, and then with seven against Cornell, man, that's 15 assists in just two games. He's really distributing the ball to the shooters like Joe Girard and Buddy Beheim. Now, Girard's one of the breakout freshmen on this team. He didn't have as good of a game against Cornell offensively as he did Seattle. But one player who's a freshman who's been consistent in those two games, and I'm excited to see how he develops, Mike, is Quincy Garrier is what we saw against Cornell, what he's capable of, not only driving inside, but if you don't respect his three-point shot, he's going to make you pay there. Oh, wee oui, wee. Oui. <laughs> Quincy Guerrier from Montreal. There it is. Everybody, he, he's starting to do what the coaches want him to do, which is go inside and use that spectacular six-foot-eight, 220-pound frame to his advantage. Instead of going into the games like he did in the exhibitions and the first couple regular season games, and he was staying on the perimeter, and he wanted to prove he could make threes. And it was to be the first thing he would do when he went into the game. In the last two games, he's gone in, and he goes inside. Get a couple rebounds, go to the free throw line, make some, see the ball go in the basket, and then against Cornell after scoring at the free throw line a couple times and getting an inside bucket he goes out to the corner and he makes the first three-pointer of his Syracuse career and he was so happy that Elijah Hughes told me after the game that um, Quincy forgot to do the celebration oh he's got one in Come his on. hip pocket he's got a three-point celebration Elijah wouldn't tell us what it was but he's got one but he was so excited he forgot to do it I'm sure we'll see that a lot more throughout the season upcoming. Do you know any more French that you'd like to uh, take us home no, with? No, no. That's it? Yeah. Well, we'll work on it because we're going to need more references for Quincy as the season Como goes along. Como That is Orange <laughs> Weekly presented by Krause Al. For Mike Waters and Nate Make, I'm Brent Axe. We'll talk to you next time.